When I was originally going to give this talk, since I really like making kind of goofy speeches, I was going to give a presentation on how to launder money. But unfortunately, I'm not really an expert in that field, so it would have required me to do a lot of research into something that is, well, illegal. So I chose to do something that I know a little bit more about, uh, which is uh, audio recording technologies. I'm going to give a very brief overview of all of the different types of devices ever since uh, the very first capturing device up till where we are now and kind of a high overview of how they work. So we're going to take it back to 1857. We have the very first audio capture device it was called the phonograph. It was created by Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. You'll notice that in the name is the word autograph, which literally means a signature. It was not actually capable of recording audio onto any type of uh, medium that would allow for playback, but rather onto a piece of parchment paper. So the way this was built is you had this large container right here. Uh, inside of there was a diaphragm, typically made out of a thin paper or some type of like a spruce pulp. And whenever any type of vibrations in the air caused by a sound would pass into the diaphragm, it would oscillate. On the back of the diaphragm, and since we can't actually see it inside of here, the diaphragm sits right about here. There's a series of levers that come through all the way to the back. And at the end of the levers, there is like, there's like a little pencil-shaped device. And the levers would actually amplify the oscillations caused by the diaphragm. And you'd have a gentleman standing here cranking this cylinder here with his hand. And on there would be a piece of parchment paper that was it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of like today's carbon copy paper. And it would push down on there and make little scribbles. An actual example of, I th believe it was a tuning fork, passed into this device that was captured is right here. So you can see it oscillating. And that's actually what would come out on the paper. Now, in 1877, an inventor by the name of Charles Crowes decided it might be a little bit better of an idea to expand upon this idea to actually use some type of a medium that you can engrave so that, we, that way you can reverse capture the sound and actually play it back in some manner. Uh, using this idea, Thomas Edison actually expanded upon Charles Crowes' idea. And in 1878, he created the phonograph, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. The design was very similar to the phonograph. It, you, it had a a capture device over here, inside it's at a diaphragm, and at the base were a series of levers. The only difference is at the bottom there is an etching needle. So whenever any type of sound would pass into it, the diaphragm would vibrate, and so would the etching needle. The medium that was actually used for recording were these tiny wax cylinders that you can see over here. They're very, very soft and pliable and very easy to, uh, to break, actually. I've broken one on accident when I was in school, and they're very expensive to replace. Uh, but so what would happen is you, you'd have the sound come in, and it would etch the markings into the wax cylinders. The louder something was, the deeper the etchings would go. The higher in pitch the sound was, the more frequent the etchings would be. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and actually, inside of the needle themselves, uh, there's these tiny little carbon granules. How this was able to actually play back sound, where when you rotated the wax cylinder after recording, the needle will go up and down in the little valleys that were made, and the carbon granules would interact with them, creating an elect electrical charge, which you could then use to, uh, driving a magnet, move the diaphragm that was inside of the capture device. Now, while the phonograph was a revolutionary means of capturing and reproducing sound, the wax cylinders themselves, as I mentioned, were very fragile and were also very expensive, and that led to mass production problems. So this all changed when Emil Berliner invented the gramophone and patented it in 1887. The gramophone used a similar type of recording material, but instead of using cylinders, used discs, which we now refer to as records. The discs were also coated with something called shellac, which is a, a type of a resin that comes from some kind of a bug larva. I don't really know where. But it was used mostly for preserving the, the discs themselves, so that way you can play them back in, in years of storage. Now, speaking of storage, there's a reason why these things caught on because they were very easy to be stored. They were very thin. You can stack them this way or that way and fit many into the same shelf space as you would a wax cylinder. Eventually, the technology got so good that companies were able to mass produce these with actual stamping machines. So they'd have an imprint of a record from the original recording, and they could just use it to stamp multiple records and get them out the door. Now, I don't know if anybody has actually used or known anyone who has had a record player, but some of the later models had different selectors on, on them for changing the revolution speeds of the discs. And actually, some albums required you to have to play the record in a certain speed. This, the default speed or the standard speed for a while was 78 RPMs. But eventually, as the technology got better, there were slower rotation speeds, uh, 45 RPM, 33 and a third, and 16 RPMs. 
The slower speeds meant that you could put more content onto the disk, but you would lose some of the audio quality. And the correlation between the disk speed and the audio quality is a relationship that we have now in modern digital recording systems that, uh, where the correlation is between sample rate and audio quality. Now, the phonograph remains the primary source for audio recordings and playback until the 1930s when, of course, some German decided to come up with a <laughs> magnetic tape machine. Uh, primarily, they were used for recording radio broadcasts during, during World War II. And the tape machine works by having a, a reel of magnetic tape, and the, the reel actually passed over a series of heads here, which applied an electrical current. When the electrical current was applied to the tape, the actual magnetic properties of the tape themselves, the particles would align in a certain way that closely resembled the source that was passed into the tape. Uh, an, an American by the name of John Mullen was actually given two of the, of the German, the Nazi tape machines at the end of World War II, and he was allowed to work on them. He spent about two years dissecting them and tearing them apart, improving their design and enhancing them, and eventually he actually gave two public demonstrations of these tape machines that he improved. The second demonstration he, he gave just so happened that Bing, Pro, Bing Crosby was there. And he was completely blown away by the audio quality. He couldn't believe that what he was hearing wasn't live. It was, it, it was just ridiculous to him. So he teamed up with Mullen. And in 1947, they actually started pre-recording Bing Crosby's radio shows. It was the first time that had ever been done. And he was famous for overdubbing laugh tracks onto his pre-recorded material to still give it the appearance of a live performance. Crosby liked this because it allowed him to produce a lot more content but that he could also replay all of his radio series in succession without any noticeable loss in quality. Now, in the early 50s, the magnetic tape machines ended up becoming improved to allow for more than one head to start recording material. Eventually, it was two, and that allowed for stereophonic sounds. So you'd have a left and a right channel. But during this time, when the first stereophonic tape recorders were coming out, a man by the name of Les Paul, yeah, he didn't just make guitars. He's actually credited for pioneering uh, modern-day multi-track recording. He would take some of these designs and tinker with them. This is actually a picture of him here dissecting the machine. You can see it's a, a, bit, a bit unwieldy there. But he would, he would uh, take, the, take the machines, dissect them, and he ended up partnering up with Ampex to use some of his designs to come up with the world's first eight-track multi-tape recorder. Using these designs, Ampex was then able to commercially produce a series of three-track and four-track recorders which became very popular for recording rock, pop, and jazz music at the time because it allowed each instrument to be in its own channel and then also to have a vocal up front and center. And famously, the Beatles were known for recording many of their greatest hits on a four-track Studer tape machine at Abbey Road Studios. And this is actually a picture of the machine right here. Now, tape machine technology kept improving all the way up into the 70s when computers started to become a bit more common. And eventually, people put the two together, and they decided, well, there's got to be some way that we can take this content we're putting on tape and use the computation power of a computer to manipulate this. And this is where digital audio tape comes into play. Their configurations were not unlike the original tape machines, that, in that they featured a reel-to-reel -reel design. And it was still magnetic tape. The only difference now is the content that was being stored on there was actually binary data. In order to record this, though, how, to, to get an analog signal into a digital format, uh, you have to use something called an analog to digital converter, which is the standard now uses PCM or pulse code modulation to actually convert the analog signal into the digital format. And PCM or pulse code modulation works by sampling an inputted analog signal thousands of times a second. Each, each sample essentially becomes a snapshot of the original analog material, regardless of what amplitude it's at. After you actually sample, a process is it's called quantization occurs, which essentially means you take the snapshot and you look and see what amplitude was the original source. And then you compare it against a series of predefined buckets, which happen to uh, be in a certain bit range. Whichever bucket was closest to the original signal is where the digital source ended up being, which unfortunately does mean that you would, in all forms of digital audio recording, you do lose a little bit of the detail from the original recording because you're just taking a small snapshot. Now, due to the exponential increase in computing power, digital audio tapes were phased out very quickly. Um, some people might remember having little tiny DAT recorders made by Sony, uh, but those didn't exist very long, and they were actually very expensive and not very reliable. Hard disks were much cheaper to, re to reproduce and were also much more re reliable, which is why everything started moving into the computer. 
Now I do want to go back to actually how digital audio recording works because it's uh, it can be a little tricky. Uh, if you guys have ever put a CD into your computer and listened to something or ripped a, a file, you might have noticed two numbers in particular that are very common. One is 44.1 kilohertz and the other is 16-bit. The first number is the sampling rate of the source material. And the sampling rate corresponds to the number of samples per second that the analog to digital converter takes before sending its content into a storage format. The 44.1 kilohertz number wasn't chosen at random though. It actually has something to do with the Nyquist theorem or called the Nyquist frequency. Which the formula here is essentially what sampling rate are you at? Well, in order to get there, I need to take two times the maximum frequency of the source content that I want to capture. If you think about the human hearing range, it's from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Most humans can't hear above 20 hertz. So it was decided by sampling slightly higher than that and then doubling that frequency would allow us to get an accurate representation of the analog audio source. What would have happened, though, if you were to, let's say, and this, and this image is actually a perfect example here. So let's say we were just going to take the peak number from the human hearing range, 20 kilohertz, and we sample it at 40 kilohertz. Well, that gives us an accurate representation of the original source. If you take the same frequency, so just say it's some kind of a pitch coming in at 20 kilohertz, and you sample it at 30 kilohertz, well, now the Nyquist theorem states that the maximum frequency we want to capture, so if we do this in reverse, we have 20 kilohertz, uh, oh, excuse me, We'll take the, this guy, 30, divide it by 2. That gets us the maximum frequency that we can capture, which is 15 kilohertz. Now we actually start losing some data. And anything above 15 kilohertz, the sound starts folding over on itself, and it actually creates harmonics. So the reason why 44.1 was chosen is because it's just slightly than the human hearing range. So if you do introduce any harmonics that aren't filtered out, we can't really hear them anyways. The second number that I mentioned was the, that 16-bit. And this corresponds to bit depth. Bit depth essentially equates into a dynamic range or signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio is essentially how many units of sound per one unit of noise. The higher that ratio is, the better things are, the better things should sound. If we use a very simple example here, let's say, for instance, instead of having an audio source that's sampled at 16 bits, which is pretty standard, we use 8 bits. Here's your analog waveform, just a simple sine wave. Well, using uh, the quantization algorithm, we go, OK, where are the closest bit buckets that I need to put this on? All right, just jam these in here. So you can see you start losing a lot of detail. The more bits we have, the more detail we can get. But of course, that, that actually costs us more storage space. That being said, I don't really have a good ending to this, because I had a lot more content I wanted to present. And actually, this is going to be, I think, part one of a multi-part series I'm going to try and go over, maybe do once every month, month and a half, and go into more depth in a digital audio recording. So just based on this, what questions do you have? Uh, also, I'll point out some pictures. This, these, these are my current interfaces, yes, with the Wiener Dog card and the I Love You card. And then these are actually two pictures of me uh, sitting in. I had to play on a recording session at Ocean Way Studios in Nashville. This is their live room, and this is their uh, mixing board here.